What we're going to do today is discuss our COVID-19 research, which is really a wonderful example of how philanthropy is powering research. And I'm delighted that we have the opportunity to share this with you. Today for the research update, um, I will be um, speaking as well as my colleagues, Jessica Hammerman and uh, Adam Lacey Holbert. This meeting is being recorded and we will make that link available to you. So um, to get started, um, for today's agenda, agenda, I'll be talking about COVID-19 and BRI's rapid response to the, uh, this uh, pandemic. Uh, Jessica Hammerman will speak about the immune response in COVID-19 and Adam Lacey Holbert um, We'll talk about how BRI is studying the virus itself and how this, uh, how we've studied other viruses in the past. So I thought I'd start with some of the big questions about COVID-19. Um, one of them is why does this virus affect the lungs and how is it spread? And we know we've all been worrying about that as we think about this disease. Why do some people have very mild disease and other people have severe disease? Um, and can you find ways to treat and prevent COVID-19? Oh, we need someone to go on mute. Uh, <laughs> um, and are people, oh, thank you. Um, and the other question is, are people protected once they've had COVID-19? And we know that's been in the news a lot um, over the last few weeks. So um, why would BRI get involved in studying um, the COVID-19? Well, our vision is for a healthy immune system for every individual. Our mission is to predict, prevent, reverse, and cure diseases of the immune system. And our scientific approach is to discover, oh, sorry. I'm so sorry. Can you see my screen now? Yes. You can. I am so sorry, everyone. That's, but uh, luckily Margaret has saved the day. Um, so our mission um, and vision um, are, are all about immune health. And I think our scientific approach is how to discover, integrate, translate, and intervene. So in this setting, most of you know that we've been very interested in autoimmunity. Um, over the years, um, although we've broadened our mission and vision over the last several years to include other diseases of the immune system like allergy, uh, thinking about treating cancer uh, through the immune response as well. We've always had an ongoing interest in infections. So why BRI is really well positioned right now to study COVID-19 is that we're experts in immunology. Uh, we certainly have the tools to study immune diseases because of our longstanding interest in them. We are very agile. We have built the infrastructure to study autoimmune diseases and human immune diseases, as well as integrating the basic science of understanding immune diseases. We have the expertise, and we have a really strong clinical connection with Virginia Mason. And we're also very collaborative. And uh, so we have partnerships across the street at Virginia Mason, throughout the Seattle uh, academic uh, immunology, world with University of Washington, Seattle Children's, Fred Hutch. We work closely with the National Institute of Health, and we also have uh, close links with uh, industry. So that puts us in a position to be able to respond very quickly to this crisis. So one of the things that some of you who've heard me talk about what BRI does and uh, the immune system have heard me talk about before is, um, what happens when the immune system fails? And so we use the analogy of a car with the gas pedal and the brake. And when people have immunodeficiency, the starter is broken and the immune system just doesn't get going. When they have allergy, we say that there's too much gas put on at the wrong time. Uh, people respond to something that's really quite benign, whether that's a peanut or a bee sting, and they go over the top and that's what really causes the problem. And then in autoimmunity, we will tell you that the brakes fail, that we start an immune response and we don't stop it appropriately. So if you think about that is how we frame many of the questions at BRI, when we think about COVID-19, 
some of the questions are around whether it's mild and the body responds to it and controls it, or if it's severe and in fact leads to uh, long hospitalizations and even death. So if we think about mild disease, I kind of think of it as the immune system on autopilot. Um, and the car speeds up to respond to this virus, eradicates the virus, and then it slows back down as, the virus, as it's controlled the virus and it recovers. And that's what's supposed to happen when we get infections. That's what the immune system is designed to do. But in severe disease, there may be several things going on um, uh, that are, are, are leading to a poor outcome. Did we leave the doors unlocked and somehow allow that virus to sneak in into the lung where it wasn't supposed to go or more of it than should have gotten there? And Adam's gonna speak a little bit about that today. Is the starter broken here? And we never responded appropriately with that initial response to the virus. Um, something we can call the innate immune response, which Jessica is an expert in. Have the brakes failed or did the accelerator get stuck? And that's a question a lot of us are thinking about, particularly in the patients who get this syndrome called cytokine storm, where their immune system seems to be running out of control. So that's a little background about how we think about this response in the context of the immune system. So what is BRI doing to study COVID-19? Um, what we've been able to do is work with our colleagues at Virginia Mason, uh, the physicians there and the whole, are treating patients um, with COVID-19. Their first case came in on February 28th. Um, and in doing that, what we've identified is a group of patients who have COVID-19 and either come to the hospital and get tested, they're positive, but they are sent home because they're doing quite well, or the patients who come in and are on the hospital floor doing reasonably well, but they need to be in the hospital. And then the group of patients who have to go to the intensive care unit. What we've been able to do is collect samples from these patients when they first come in, and then those that stay in the hospital over time. Our goal is to study these samples to ask the question of what can they tell us about the people who recover, the people who die from this disease, and the people who maybe even become immune to the disease. We're comparing those to people who may have come into the emergency room or the clinic with a fever, feeling poorly, and they actually are tested negative. So we have a comparison group. We can take these samples, which we've been gathering now over the last several weeks, bring them to the laboratory, and do the thing that we at BRI always do, which is study all aspects of the immune system. We can look at the genetics of these individuals, look at the cells that we think drive the disease, and even the proteins and antibodies that people are making. We generate this information and then we use our analytical skills and platforms through our systems immunology group. And of course, the goal is to come up with answers to our questions. So I think one of the most exciting things about this project is to think about the, the timeline from ideas to data. Remember I said BRI is particularly agile and we have the systems in place to study human disease. Um, so typically we have a question we, or develop a hypothesis, as us scientists always say. We then write grants and get funding, but also we then, once we have that, have to write a plan up. We have to go to our institutional review board and get approvals to go forward to do this work. We then have to identify patients and subjects who want to participate in our studies, get those samples to the lab, work with them, generate fancy and interesting data and answers. Well, typically, I've put your, our timeline here. And in this timeline, I put these dashed lines because typically funding is either from six months to two years, uh, as many of us know. But even once we get that funding, it, it takes time to do all of this work. And I would say typically it takes one to five years to go through this timeline. What we've been able to do is do this um, in a period of less than four weeks, um, which is uh, incredible and has required everybody at BRI to be part of the team. And that's what's been excited about, exciting about the response that we've had. It also gets us in a position where we can start giving answers to our community um, very quickly in this emergency situation. And so I'm gonna end with um, 
a little bit of data just because we as scientists love data, but it also shows that we've literally gone from the bedside back into the uh, bench, and we already have data that can help us think about this disease. So I'm showing a pretty picture uh, generated by our systems group, but it was uh, the work of many, many people. So when you look at this, there's a group of healthy donors here. This is what their cells look like. There's a group of patients here, and this is what their cells look like. So they look a little different. I'm going to highlight that for you. These are the T cells. These are the cells we think of as kind of the directors of the orchestra um, that tell the immune system who to attack and what to do. You can see here that in healthy subjects that we have these nice CD4 and CD8 T cells. And in patients who are in the hospital with COVID-19, they have many fewer T cells. So they have really what looks like a, a deficient immune response here. We go up to the top to this nice purple group of cells that are Jessica's favorite cells, so she'll be talking about those. We see these monocytes and dendritic cells, and they drive a lot of the inflammation in the body. They're incredibly helpful and powerful cells, but they also can cause additional or extra inflammation. And when we look at our patients in the hospital, we can see there's many more of these cells than there were in healthy individuals. And then finally, when we look at a group, these cells in brown that are um, we call CD19 cells or B cells, you can see that what looks the, what they look like normally, there's many, many fewer of them. B cells are the cells that make protective antibodies, which we know are vital to develop long-term immune protection. And these are the cells we're going to drive with uh, our upcoming vaccine. So this is just a little a snippet of the data that we've generated in four weeks that can help us here at BRI look at um, our patients, try to understand what's happening in their immune system, helps us generate the next hypotheses to say, well, why did some of these people not do well? And that information we think we'll be um, getting more and more of um, over the next uh, several months. Uh, and hopefully we'll be able to um, address some really important issues uh, and help uh, develop better therapies for this disease. So that's my quick introduction. I am now going to pass the baton on to Jessica Hammerman, um, and she is going to take over the screen. Are you going to screen share, Jessica, or am I going to control the slides? I'm going to screen share from my screen. Good. That's great. I'm going to stop sharing. Sounds great. So hopefully this will work seamlessly. Okay, so I am hoping that you all can uh, see my screen. I unfortunately can't see any people. So um, <laughs> I assume you can. Uh, Jane, yeah, we maybe, can see it, Jess. Yeah, it's all good, thank you. Okay, so I wanted to talk to you a little bit about the immune response to COVID-19 and what might go wrong in some severe patients. And as Jane said, um, there's really a very complicated set of immune responses that need to happen whenever you have an infection. And what we'd really like to understand is what is the difference between these sort of happy green people here who get all sick, maybe they're sick enough to go to the ER and get a test, so we know they're um, COVID, they have COVID-19, but they're not sick enough to stay in the hospital and they do pretty well. And how does that differ from these people who have more severe disease, who are in the hospital, um, who need to be hospitalized sometimes for quite a long time, or even have to um, have very severe disease, have to be in the ICU and potentially um, be on a ventilator? Because we, we need to understand what the difference is, and some of those differences may have to be to how your immune uh, system contributes. But first I wanna talk about you know, what goes right in patients who do well. And so if we think about how you get an infection, so um, these little spiky guys here, these are uh, virus particles. And as you all know, we inhale viral particles and they go deep into our lungs. Um, I will say that this is not to scale. <laughs> um, those are very large viruses compared to uh, what you would really see. And so deep in our lungs, we have um, these alveoli, these um, air sacs in our lung where we absorb oxygen. Um, and so this is a very important part of our lung. And we know that SARS-CoV-2 virus um, can get very deep in our lung 
where it can infect um, these epithelial cells. So in lining of all of your airways, you have so these tall um, columns, these are cells of your airways. And what we know is that the virus can attach to these um, and actually in, enter and infect and live in these cells. And so I know Adam will talk a lot more about that. Um, so this is how infection is initiated in everybody. Um, but if we zoom in and think about how the immune system actually fights uh, SARS-CoV-2, the name of the virus that causes COVID-19. And so we know if we look underneath um, these layers of, uh, of your airways, these epithelial cells in the um, lung, we know that we have lots of blood vessels. And I'm sure um, having attended BRI events before, you know that uh, your white blood cells um, are your immune cells, and they are going through all of your blood vessels that are running through all your body all the time looking for infection, right? They want to know where the infection is so they can get there. And what happens when you have an infection, the way that um, there's communication between your infected cells up here in the lung and the immune cells are proteins called cytokines. So cytokines are these very uh, small proteins that cells release when they are infected. So in this case, infected with SARS-CoV-2 virus. And they're basically, you can think of them like a fire alarm or a smoke alarm. Um, so you have a fire in your house, you have something you wanna deal with, right here it's an infection in your lung. Um, and you wanna send an alarm out to your immune system saying, hey, there's an infection here, immune system, you need to come and deal with it. Um, and so we have these cytokines that are made that uh, then talk to the immune cells in the bloodstream. And then what they do is some of the cells uh, leave the bloodstream to come into the infected tissue. So here it's the infected lung. Um, and our immune cells have all kinds of great ways to try to get rid of infected cells, like um, cells infected with SARS-CoV-2. In one way is that um, a certain kind of T cell can actually kill virally infected cells. And so you have this um, smoke alarm going off saying fire, fire. You could think of your immune cells like the, um, the firefighters coming in um, and then they spray their hose, they put out the fire. And so what happens if this all works really well, um, like Jane said, you come back and here now again, we have a nice healthy looking lung. It is not virally infected and your immune system is again, just back in the, uh, uh, in the blood vessels circulating around looking for the next fire um, to deal with. So, um, so if we think about that's how uh, we want the immune response to happen. As Jane said, it um, comes on, it deals with the infection and then it goes away when the infection is over. So that's what we're looking for. Um, and so we want to understand how the immune system contributes to these, uh, to severe COVID-19 and what the difference is between these green happy people and these less happy people down here. Um, and we know one thing that's um, uh, different between some people who don't do very well with severe COVID-19 is they have some underlying medical conditions. Um, and I'm not going to talk about that today. But we also think that the immune system can contribute to the difference between um, these more mild patients who deal well with the virus and those who do not. And this is um, something you may have heard of in the media called cytokine storm. And so if you remember early on, I told you that cytokines are these little communication proteins uh, that are made by cells that are infected that tell the immune system basically that there's an uh, infection here, they're the smoke alarm, um, saying this is the location of the infection and please come here and deal with it. And so this is how every productive immune response starts. But in a cytokine storm, which is seen in um, some severe patients, what happens is um, the cytokines never stop. So these uh, infected cells keep making uh, cytokines and so instead of just having this initial uh, wave of cells that can deal with the virus, you have more and more cells coming into the tissue um, and it just doesn't stop. So how does that, why does that happen? Um, and so it could be that this very early cytokine response is too strong. Um, and so yeah, if you have too strong a response to the virus, um, you're gonna call in too many immune cells. Or it could be that the cells that come in can't really clear the virus. And so you have continual stimulation of the immune system um, and the immune system knows to stop 
when you no longer have any virus there. But if the virus can't get cleared, basically the system keeps going. You could think about it like um, this fire alarm or smoke alarm. It keeps going and going and going. More and more firefighters come to your fire and they keep hosing down your house, but the fire never goes out. Um, and it could be a combination of these. And we know that in cytokine, in cytokine storm that you see in other diseases, that it's a contribution of both too much of this cytokine response and an ability, inability to um, get rid of the infection that causes this sort of cycle of disease that basically won't stop. Um, and how does this really contribute to severe disease? And so while we all know that um, immune cells are great because they will kill these virally infected cells, um, they also produce a lot of toxic products. And if they keep coming in, they can cause uh, really a lot of inflammation associated problems. And so one of those is pneumonia. So so many cells coming into the airway, causing a lot of tissue damage that your airway can no longer function to um, absorb oxygen. So that's a huge problem in COVID-19. Um, but also when you have this cytokine storm going on, the cytokines aren't only where the infection is. What happens is so many are made and so many cells of the immune system are just getting activated continually is that you actually have a what we call a systemic cytokine storm. So in all of your blood vessels, you have lots of these cytokines basically turning on and ramping up the immune system all over your body, not just where the infection is in the lung. And this um, can cause a lot of problems both with kidney and liver damage. And we know that these are also contributors to um, severe uh, disease as well as even death in COVID-19 patients. So how do we study um, cytokine storm in COVID-19 here at BRI? And so as Jane explained to you, we have, um, we have these amazing, just over the last uh, month or six weeks, uh, Jane and other people here at BRI and um, physicians at Virginia Mason across the street have um, been collecting blood samples that we can use. And what's really important about the blood samples we're collecting is it's not just um, from those who have severe disease, but also from those who are mild, who show up in the ER test positive for SARS-CoV-2, but then go home because they're not that sick, um, as well as people who are coming into the ER who have other problems, but they don't have uh, COVID-19. And so to understand anything about um, a scientific question, we need to have comparison groups. So something that's so great about um, the cohort that's put together is um, we have all these three different groups that we can compare to each other. And we can ask, and we're actually doing it right now, um, how do cytokines, so these communication molecules that are made by infected cells and then get amplified throughout the immune system, how do they differ in these three groups? Um, and then also the immune cells. So the cells I love, monocytes, and some of the cells that Jane loves, uh, T cells and B cells. You know, what are the dynamics of these cells that, and how do they look in these different groups? Because that might help tell us what's causing the problems. Um, and Jane showed you that we can see differences actually in these first initial analyses, which were so exciting when I got to see them a week ago, um, show both that there's more uh, monocytes, these cells that make a lot of these inflammatory proteins, but less T and B cells, um, the cells that would be actually clearing the infection. So it's really um, interesting picture. And the other thing that's pretty exciting is um, we we're able to collect some samples from the airways of some of the severe patients. And we can ask is how is what we see in circulation in the bloodstream, how does that relate to the proteins that are in the actual lung? So is it the same proteins? Are there different ones? And that's, um, I think, an amazing resource that we're going to have going forward um, to try to understand issues in the lung as well as issues in the rest of the body. Um, so what are we hoping to find? Um, you know, all science is interesting no matter what we find, but we'd also like to be able to help people who have severe COVID-19. And so we want to try to use this information in a couple of ways. One is we want to ask if we can use this information to identify who will go on to severe disease um, so we can intervene early. And so um, one of the amazing strengths of the uh, patient cohorts that we have um, is that they'll be what we call longitudinally sampled. So we're getting samples from people on the day they show up at Virginia Mason Hospital, but then patients that are um, hospitalized, we're getting um, samples every few days. 
And some of those patients that are hospitalized um, get released, they do very well, but some of them actually move to the ICU and they do much worse. And so we'll have data on them very early and we can ask if we can identify early who's gonna go into severe disease because we know that early intervention is always gonna be helpful. Um, and then the other thing we wanna ask is, come of some, can some of these proteins we're measuring, these uh, communication molecules called cytokines, be targeted therapeutically? And we know that many, um, Autoimmune diseases are treated by blocking some of these cytokines, such as IL-6 or IL-1 or TNF. Um, and you may have also seen there's been a lot of, um, there's been some media around in patients with cytokine storm, treating them with um, therapeutics that target one of these important cytokines called interleukin-6. But we really don't have the whole spectrum and you know all of the cytokines that could be contributing because there may be some um, other cytokines that we have therapeutics for already because they've been developed for autoimmune disease that could uh, also be uh, repurposed here in COVID, severe COVID-19 patients. Um, and so we're really excited to look at these patients' uh, sets that we've put together that we're already looking at and are looking at going forward to try to address these questions and so that we can help people with severe disease. And with that, um, I think uh, Adam Lacey Holbert will talk to us about uh, viral, his viral studies. Great, thank you, Jessica. I'm going to I'm going to stop set sharing. up my screen sharing. I should have taken over now. <laughs> yep. Let's try to go to slideshow. There we are. Okay, I hope you can see my slides. Yes. Hello everyone, so my name is Adam Lacey Hulbert. Um, I run a lab on the third floor, just, just downstairs from Jessica and upstairs from Jane. Um, but as you know, the BRI, we all work together. So, you know, we have a lot of um, interplay and interaction between our various labs. So uh, a major part of my, probably about a third of what we do in, in, in the lab is it's really interested in the immune response to um, to viruses, to particular types of virus. And I've been asked before, um, why do we study viruses at uh, BRI? And there's a couple of really good reasons why we study viruses in an autoimmunity research um, institute. Um, one of them is, of course, just, just that studying a healthy immune system really helps us to understand autoimmunity. So, Viruses are something that, that the immune system is set up to deal with, as, as Jane mentioned in her opening slides. And so understanding how the immune system works to deal with the viruses gives us really important fundamental insights into, into just how the immune system works and how it is supposed to work. Um, what we also know is that, particularly for some autoimmune diseases such as lupus, many of the things that go wrong in those diseases are the parts of the immune system that are specialized for recognizing and responding to viruses. Viruses contain DNA and RNA and a lot of the ways in which we sense DNA and RNA seem to go wrong in autoimmune diseases and give rise to things like anti-DNA, antibodies that we think help to drive disease. So actually studying viruses is really quite um, important in our understanding of the autoimmune disease. And a lot of what we do is to compare things that are happening in autoimmune disease with things that are happening uh, in viral responses. So that's one of the things that we work on. I'm not gonna talk any more about that today. Um, the other thing that we're very interested in is trying to use viruses to understand new kinds of immunity, uh, particularly um, immunity that doesn't happen in what we think of as traditional immune cells, but happens in some of those airway cells uh, that Jessica talk, talked about. And that's really what I'm gonna, what I'm gonna focus on um, today. I just wanna to say too, uh, at the outset, you know, one of the other questions that I, that I get is, can we use some of the methods we use to study um, viruses to study SARS-CoV-2 and COVID-19? And the answer absolutely is yes. In fact, some of the research uh, that we already um, have worked out with other viruses actually we think can be directly applicable to uh, SARS-CoV-2. We've already done some work previously on, on the predecessors of SARS-CoV-2, which are, are the original SARS coronavirus and the MERS coronavirus. And I'll talk very briefly about that. Um, and just to say that, yes, we are adapting what we're doing to study COVID-19. And this is happening across many different research programs at BRI, as you've heard from Jane and Jessica um, 
already. So we're really uh, all together pivoting to try to, to use all of our research tools in different areas to um, address important questions in COVID-19. So as Jessica said, produced very, uh, described to you very, very clearly, um, airway cells are the first targets of SARS-CoV-2, and that's really what I'm going to talk about today. So, so as Jessica said, the virus enters the airways, gets down into the lungs, and then when it's in these, um, these lung uh, alveolar sacs, it actually attacks uh, and enters these um, epithelial cells. So these are the first cells that really encounter the virus. And what we're interested in is, are there ways in which we can make these airway cells defend themselves better? Um, to use Jane's analogy, is there a way in which we can lock the door to stop the virus from getting into cells? Or are there ways in which once the virus is into these cells, can we trap or kill the virus in those cells before it has the ability to replicate, make more copies and go off and infect other cells? So that's a focus of some of the projects in, in, my, in my lab. So how do we study this problem? Well, the way that we study it is to use something called a, a genetic screen. This is a very powerful method that we use in the sort of fundamental um, immunology that, that we do in the labs, where we, we want, particularly if we want to discover new genes and new pathways and new processes that have never been studied before. So the system that we use is to take airway cells and we grow them in these, in these petri dishes in, in culture. And what we do is to take these airway cells and we do some genetic tricks to randomly turn genes on and off in these airway cells. So, so every cell gets this little genetic switch, it's something called a transposon, and in every cell that transposon turns a different gene on or off. So what we've done here is to represent all those different cells by, by cells of different colors. Obviously the cells aren't actually different colors when we do this, but what the colors represent is different genes getting turned on and off in those cells. So we've taken cells that normally all look exactly the same into cells that are all subtly different. Each of them has a different gene turned on or off, and that subtly changes the properties of all of those cells. Then we do the nasty thing. We come in and we give those cells a virus, uh, which normally would infect the cells and kill them all. If we give the virus to a, a plate of normal airway cells, all of the cells will die. What we find when we give the virus to these cells that have all been changed is that some of the cells have acquired genetic changes that enable them to survive this virus infection. We call these, these resistant cells. They're resistant to infection by the virus. All the other cells die off and these cells survive. And then we grow those cells up. We put them through the, the DNA sequencer that we have here. And we say, well, which genes have changed in these individual cells? And we find the genes that have changed in the purple cell. We find the genes that have changed in the green cell. And, and those genes, are what, changes in those genes are what are causing those cells to become resistant. So this enables us to find genes that are important for fighting infection by the virus. And then we go off and study these genes to try to find new pathways by which cells can fight viral infection. So it's a quite a simple process, but it leads to lots of complicated um, biology. Uh, we've already used this process uh, in a number of other viruses. Um, we often thought, we thought from the very beginning that this would be a useful method to try to understand mechanisms by which we could fight pandemics. Um, we picked a couple of pandemic viruses. We didn't pick coronavirus at the time. Uh, we picked other pan, pan, pandemic viruses. Uh, the viruses that we did pick originally to work on were um, Ebola virus. Um, Ebola virus is very deadly. Um, we don't use real Ebola virus at BRI. We use a fake version of um, Ebola virus that's, that's safe to use at BRI, but it recapitulates many of the things that the real Ebola virus do, um, does. And then we work with collaborators to then um, extend the findings we get with Ebola virus into real, into real virus. We also work with influenza virus and different strains of um, influenza, those that are more benign and those that are more um, 
pathogenic and deadly uh, to, to try to understand again how, how cells can become resistant to um, influenza. And we've identified some new resistance pathways for both viruses. And I'm just going to give you a little bit of detail uh, using an example from one of the, uh, the genes that we found for Ebola virus, just to sort of illustrate the sorts of things that we find using these screens and uh, how they're changing our understanding about viral infection and uh, viral defense. So I'm just going to give you a little bit of detail about how viruses infect cells, because this is really the process that we are trying to um, disrupt or protect against in the airway epithelial cells. So these viruses come along, this is the virus, this is the, the plasma membrane of the cell, so this is the outer, uh, the outer surface of the cell that, that keeps all the cell um, insides together and, and protects the cell from what's happening outside. And, and this, this region here is the inside of the cell. So the first thing the virus needs to do is to get into the cell. And normally viruses do that in two quite distinct uh, parts. The first thing that they need to do is to bind to the surface of the cell and get taken up into the cell. And that's done using um, a, a protein on the surface of the virus and it binds to a specific receptor on the surface of a cell. Many of you maybe have heard about something called ACE2, which is a receptor for uh, the SARS-CoV-2 virus on the surface of cells. This is what ACE2 does. It is a normal, a normal protein that we have on our surface. The virus has evolved a protein that can bind to that protein, and that triggers the ability of the virus to get into the cell. But that's only half of the virus's journey to infection. When the virus comes in, it is surrounded by the plasma membrane of the cell. So the virus then needs to fuse with that plasma membrane to get its own DNA or RNA, RNA in the case of um, SARS-CoV-2. This is the genetic material of the virus. It needs to deliver that genetic material into the cell. And the way it does that is to fuse its membrane with the membrane of the host cell. And this often uses additional proteins. So you need the receptor to get in, but you need additional proteins to actually undergo fusion. Once fusion happens, the genome of the virus is then into the cell, and then it can really go to work. What it does is quickly makes lots of copies of itself. The genome encodes for all of the proteins that the virus needs uh, to work. So the virus very quickly co-ops the cells to make lots of proteins, lots more copies of its own genome, and then it assembles those into new viral particles, and those are then released back uh, out of the cell to go off and infect other cells and really drive the um, infection. And this is how you know, just a few viral particles getting into the, into the lung are able to quickly turn themselves into millions of viral particles that infect the entire lung. So we're interested in finding ways to block this process. And what we've discovered from our, from our screens in Ebola in flu is that we're able to identify new genes uh, involved in every part of this process. We've discovered things that, that block uh, the ability of the receptors to work, usually by removing those um, receptors. We've discovered genes that are involved in this fusion pathway, and particularly in found genes that cells can express that will specifically block this fusion of viruses. And then we find things that actually block the function of the viral proteins and stop the virus from making new copies of itself and releasing those copies back out. And I'm just going to show you, just to dive into the science for one second, I'm just going to show you some detail about one of these genes that we discovered. This was a very surprising finding. We actually discovered a gene, a gene called C2TA. It's, it's not important what the gene is, um, but this is a gene that we all knew about as immunologists because it's a really important gene involved in how immune cells talk to each other but it had never been thought of as a way in which cells might defend themselves against viruses. And what we discovered is that um, this gene, when it's turned on, actually blocks the virus from infecting. So these are some electron micrograph pictures. So these are very high resolution pictures of the cell. Uh, this is a cell. This isn't the surface of the moon. This is, this is the inside of the cell. And what you're seeing here, this, this part here is blown up and magnified here. This is a viral particle. This is actually um, one of our fake Ebola viruses. And this is inside one of these bubbles. So, so that black line is this plasma membrane and is completely surrounding this virus. So this virus has been internalized, but it is now undergoing fusion to deliver the DNA from here 
into the cytoplasm of the cell. What we find when we express high levels of C2TA in our airway cells is that we see pictures like this. What this is, and when you blow it up, you can see it here. This is a much larger version of this bubble that is filled with virus. What happens is the virus gets internalized, but it cannot fuse. C2TA blocks that fusion process. So we block things here. What that means is that essentially you can't get productive infection of that cell. The virus gets in, but it's a dead end. It can't go anywhere and it stops um, infection. So we didn't know anything about this pathway and we've discovered it using this genetic screen. What's interesting about this pathway is that many of the the, the processes involved in fusion of Ebola virus are similar to the processes involved in fusion of SARS and of SARS-CoV-2. And what we had already shown is that this same pathway can trap the SARS virus and the MERS virus inside cells. What we're testing right now is to see if the same pathway can block infection with SARS-CoV-2. And our hope is that by discovering that, it gives us an additional um, target we can go after in cells to say, can we promote this pathway in cells to try to block infection? So that's just a quick dive into some of the science. I hope I didn't go too quickly uh, for all of you. Um, just to really summarize sort of where, where we are, uh, a lot of the research that we're doing right now is, is changing our systems, adapting our systems, so we can find these types of resistant mechanisms specifically for SARS-CoV-2, the virus that causes COVID-19. We're also testing some of the specific mechanisms that we've already identified from Ebola and flu to try to see if some of the things that we've already discovered will actually apply and be applicable to, um, to SARS-CoV-2. What we then want to do, having found those new pathways and genes, is to go and test these in real lung cells with real virus. And this is just one example where BRI is such a wonderful place to work. Um, just upstairs from us is Steve Ziegler's lab. Steve works on asthma. And as part of that, he's developed these beautiful models uh, with, with collaborators at Seattle Children's, Jason Debley and others at Seattle Children's. They have discovered these, uh, developed these beautiful models of, of real human lung cells that we grow in a dish to look exactly like the human lung. So actually what we can do is take this rather artificial system and then test that with real SARS-CoV-2 using biosafety um, level three containment facilities at Seattle Children's. And we can test that on real lung cells to really discover, you know, which of these pathways actually work against real viruses in the real setting. So that's just to sort of give you a summary of, of the sort of work that we're doing and how we're trying to pivot some of our research uh, to really get at some fundamental questions related to SARS-CoV-2 and COVID-19. And I just want to reinforce, uh, certainly from my point, and I think from all of us, that this is, this is a team effort. This is something that this project, as you can see here, is really a collaboration between different investigators at BRI, uh, other groups in Seattle, and, and places beyond that. Um, the speed and cooperation that we found in what we're doing, and as Jane said in other things, um, the speed and cooperation really is unprecedented. Uh, within BRI, we've always worked well together, but it's really exciting to see scientists from all over Seattle and all over the world coming together to address this, this problem. And I personally, and I think we all feel this, just want to say a thank you to my lab and to all the labs at BRI and all the other people at BRI who are working towards this, you know, these dedicated and willing scientists and support teams who have done so much to really enable us uh, to pivot quickly and to really get these systems up and running to study this disease. <laughs>